so ground force trip practices. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, talks and blog posts and stories online about best practices, and I thought that was very boring and lame, so I thought I would uh, change that up. So here's very important. Uh, do not do the exact opposite of everything I'm about to tell you. Um, this is all 100% real stuff. Very, very important topics. Okay, so why do we use rails in the first place? Why do we use Ruby? Because it's a burden to use a challenge. It's so verbose, right? Ben Cat talks about Ruby as a uh, language that uh, just doesn't deal with the ceremony so much. So much ceremony and stuff in Java. So we use Ruby because we use less code. We Easier is better, faster is better, finishing quicker is better. Just do the first thing that you can come up with. Because why work harder than really have to? Minimize the amount of time you spend at work. Why are we bottom of the group It's not going to maximize, optimize our time. Try to get other people to do your work for you. Now, this is, of course, implicit in the idea of reusing plates. Why would I spend all that time figuring out every Lots of different batch, security, uh, GMS, RabbitMQ, I can just plug in a plug in and uh, get most of the work done. If I can then kick that forward a little bit and go 100% instead of just the 50 to 75% of the plug you gave me, that's even better. Lazy is good to be lazy. When you find problems, decide. Now, if maybe now is the best time to pursue this, probably not. You're going to want to have time to think about it. It is not necessarily the case that it's going to be way more expensive later to fix your problems than it is to fix them right now. So again, relax. Don't have to get so uh, worried. But when you're doing these things, these are a little hold on to against the grain. So some people are going to disagree with these approaches. They're wrong. We're right. We know the truth. So you're going to have to cover your tracks a little bit. You're going to have to make sure that when, even when things go a little tough, things go a little weird because you're following these very important practices, that you are not uh, obviously telling the crowd down these things. So cover your tracks. In general, I think the, the general philosophy of the entire talk here is to be more like your talk. Just relax, um, play more, cuddle more, spend more time. So, uh, a new thing that I added uh, just now, <laughs> and I'm actually uh, a little bit late for the talk, um, is it's perfectly compatible, perfectly fine to just go away, not pay hardly any attention to what's going on in the Ruby, Rails, or in the space. Because it's not like there's an insane amount of energy and uh, activity going on in this community. Things won't have changed all that much in six months. Um, it's not like you'll have release after release <laughs> after release of Rails. Learn yourself because you have to pay attention to it. Um, I'm teaching a class in the fall at Harvard. I'm going to have to learn Rails to teach Rails in September. I can't believe this. This is actually true. I'm going to have to learn 2 2, and 2 3, and 2 4 because I have not, <laughs> not been there. This is going to be a very weird thing, I think. Okay. So, yes, it's true that Ruby makes our lives easier, Rails makes our lives easier, Gradle makes our lives easier, all these awesome technologies are in projects, right back, um, make our lives easier. But there are hidden downsides. Rails can be frustrating. You can sort of drink the Kool Aid and just go guns blazing and just run, 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 and uh, implement stuff and implement stuff. It's so close, and then you hit this wall. And it's just, it's not quite there. It's just, you know, all of a sudden. So, uh, again, focus is it's easier and simpler. So you really want to think like a PHP developer. That's the key. <coughs> PHP is huge, right? They have a billion users. How many of us will ever work in an application that has a billion users? Well, if you think like a PHP developer, maybe you can. So, um, Yes, you can use classes and object-oriented programming and uh, structure and stuff like that in PHP, but you don't have to. You just have to go your way to, to uh, from it. Um, so if you don't have to, don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal. 
So use that approach in Rails controllers and Rails Peaks. So uh, be very rigid about the one-to-one -one relationship between controllers and main classes, and also between controllers and services, right? Um, there's no reason why you'd ever want to I'm actually, to be honest, shocked uh, on the mail list. Uh, you guys remember when we used to have mail list? Um, back before I left, there was a mail list and apparently the spirit box gone. Um, but we had a mail list and people would complain about it. We would ask, is it okay to use uh, two main classes in a controller? That's a really shocking question, isn't it? I mean, you, you, people see this, right? And um, we sort of, uh, because of the way that the scaffolding is generated, we sort of so, um, so follow this practice. If the scaffolding generates a controller for a domain class, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship, stick with that. Don't change it. Um, so trust the generated code, uh, because people that you trust have created it. We wrote programs that wrote, wrote, wrote your code for you. Um, um, so put everything in control. Because that's your sort of your front line, right? That's your the, uh, the war against your users. <laughs> and I said, I said, say that. I mean, what do you have users? What would I like to tell you here? All I do is complain. Got crash. Has a bug. Doesn't have this feature. Formatted my hard drive. Um, <laughs> Sadly, the designers of the GSPs were not able to overcome uh, really harsh and search uh, GVM locations, artificial graphical annotation. So, I mean, there, there's an a actual size to, to uh, a limit to the size of a GSP. So, um, but there are strategies for that. Community includes, um, you really have to use your colleagues for intact to, 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 uh, to pull some code out of your GSPs. Uh, 64 k
So um, as I was doing this first version of this talk, I was doing these slides, and I made a comment, I think, it wasn't an answer, it was a comment, I was like, about you know, the use of GSBs, and, and uh, you know, never put tons of code in your GSBs. And this, was, this is a real question, so I'm actually asked this. And I mean, I literally had one of these freaking <laughs> serious people, I mean, and I was so frustrated that I didn't dare to actually answer the question, because I tried to be as polite as possible, and there was no way I was going to be able to reject myself. So, which, uh, Okay, so uh, a little bit of a change of tax. So transactions, right? What would an application be without data? And typically we store our data in databases um, or data stores. So assuming that you're uh, not using a NoSQL data store, you're using a relational database, you're going to have classic transactions. Uh, there are transactions in uh, non-relational databases, but let's focus on the uh, sort of old school uh, transactional uh, relational database. So if you do multiple edits, deletes, curates, whatever, you want those to all succeed together or all fail together, right? You want a bunch of discrete things to be as if they were an atomic action. It's a very good thing. Um, so how do we do that in controllers? We're going to be doing all of our working controllers. We're going to need some machinery to enable this. So it turns out that in uh, the latest versions of Rails, there's a new at transactional, because there's the old school spring transactional annotation playing games and controllers. But there's a new annotation that can be used in controllers. How awesome is that? So, um, and actually, and you guys will have to tell me if this is the case, we're still carrying scalping with at transactional in the controls, right? Is this true? Yes. We did for very recently. So when you do a generate all or generate controller for doing class into two, two, three, four, the controller has that transaction. Is that right? Right. So um, all structure generated code. So <laughs> if the generated controller has transactional in it, then that is basically a giant sign saying do transactions in your controllers. Because why else would we do that? So. Um, Sadly, um, if you're ever doing this <laughs> shift, right, you don't want to put a hundred percent of your code in your controller. So someone's going to have to spill over by nature into your GSBs. Um, because when you're actually generating your HTML, for example, if you're doing your looping, if you're doing your testing, so that just doesn't fit in your controller. So you're going to have to put some of the code in your GSBs. So it's very likely that some of your transactional work is going to end up having to be in your GSBs. But then we can't use that transactional GSBs because, as cool as the new uh, annotation is, Still lame because it can't be used in GSP, that is not good. Um, so, this should be fixed. It's a glaring error in the new uh, transaction support. Um, but, our hero with transaction uh, jumps in. Suit. So, um, you can just wrap your uh, transactional code in your triplets in with transaction line, and there you go. So, you're Doing the right thing. You have all your code in your frontline controller defense layer. Um, you're doing your transactions, your transactions are important, and you're good to go. You should not put all of your transaction code in services, which are, some people claim, uh, the natural place to do transactions um, because they are automatically. Transaction by default, without doing anything at all. Um, so the newer transactions, uh, the, the newer services that we generate um, do have an app transactional annotation in them. Um, but that's only because uh, there are some benefits to using the, the new annotation um, over the, <coughs> the, the old the old uh, annotation. Um, but if you have nothing at all, if you just have a, a uh, basically an empty service class in the Rails app services directory. It's whatever, user service, who service, whatever it's called. And um, it doesn't say static transactional is true, static transactional is false. And there's no incidence whatsoever of the word transactional. Um, it just has a bunch of methods in there. That is 100% transactional by default. You have to turn on transactionality in services. Um, 
So if you have, for example, a uh, service that just doesn't do any data, so it doesn't do any writes or uh, edits or deletes or anything, you should actually say static transaction was false. It's a lot because there's a small cost to starting a transaction, um, setting the transaction to automated mode off, doing a bunch of non transactional work, and then flushing an, an empty transaction and committing that. So it's not really expensive, but that'll add up. So you definitely want to, uh, to turn off your transactions if you don't need them. Um, but you'll notice that the new services do have the after transactional, and the reason for that is um, this is a serious um, thing. Um, the, the big benefit of the new uh, transaction annotation is that it doesn't use a proxy around the class. It actually does an ASD transformation. It's pretty cool. Uh, Graham came up with this, and uh, it's very, very slick. So one of the problems with transactions, well, proxy uh, means in general. This is in uh, security with uh, app security means. Um, in the cache plugin, Method to be cached. Uh, you know, this, this problem that I'm going to describe is, is present in all these all these scenarios. Because what happens is when you have a, a standard, an old the old style spring transactional class, spring does this. It subclasses your class that runs on it. It's easy with it. Creates an instance of the subclass. Creates an instance of your bean and injects your bean instance into the, the actual proxy instance. And the proxy implements the same interface or has the same uh, methods. But every time you go to call a method, it's going to intercept that. It's going to look at the transaction definition for that uh, method. And if you haven't done anything at all, it's going to be standard, um, standard configuration. So it's going to be uh, transactional is uh, on by default. Uh, so it's, uh, the scope of the uh, isolation level is the standard isolation level that's uh, required. So if there's no transaction running, it's going to start one. At the end of the function, at the end of the method, if it started it, it's going to then commit it and flush it. Uh, if there is a, a transaction running, it's going to detect that. It's going to join the transaction, and at the end of the method, since it didn't start the transaction, it's not going to commit it because whoever did start it on the outside is going to uh, flush it or, or uh, commit it or, or roll it back on the outside. Um, if you have annotated it or configured it to be different, if it's, for example, requires new or not supported or whatever, it's going to Force those rules, or any exceptions it needs to do, join any transactions it needs to do. It's going to do all that work for you. Then, having done that, it's then going to call your actual method and then uh, do the work. It's pretty cool stuff. So, the same thing happens in the screen security annotated uh, services. When you say at secured, it's going to do the security check to see if you're logged in, see if you've got the right role, see if you've got the right whatever. Uh, assuming that everything passes, it's then going to call that function, that method. Uh, there's a functional lock that means it's going to be JavaScript programming. Um, <coughs> And then it's going to uh, actually call your, your method. If, however, you're not logged in or you don't have the right roles, it's going to throw an exception about you. So that's really cool stuff. But if you're inside of the, uh, the actual B instance, so from method A, you call method B directly, you're not going to, um, it's not going to see the requires new or the not supported or anything like that because you're already underneath the proxy. So you, what you have to do is you actually have to come back out go through the guarded method. Does that make sense? So if, because the whole process requires that you are proxy. The proxy does the check of your current state and fixes it to be correct. It starts the transaction, joins the transaction, whatever. But if you're already in the actual B instance, that can't happen. So you have to get an actual reference to the spring bean and call the, the, the method there. So that's obscure and weird, and you, know, you sort of get burned by it and figure out how to fix it and you go on with your day. But if you use a new annotation, that's not at all a problem. Because instead of creating a proxy, what the, what the new annotation does is it rewrites your method. So it writes every method that's transactional uh, inside of a little, basically, a transactional block right there. Um, so you don't have to think about anything along the lines of should I? Uh, when you come back in or anything like that. It just works. It works exactly the way you know it work. So, uh, and it's not exactly compatible with the old uh, annotation. Every feature of the old annotation is supported with the new one, plus the new one does all this cool stuff. Definitely want to use the, the Grails at transaction. That's all true. Back to the talk. Um, 
So don't use earbuds. Because none of that was important. Um, so don't worry about making small funky methods that are that do one thing. Don't bother with creating services that are focused and do one uh, thing. Um, because it's not like that those would be easy to test. Uh, and that doesn't really make sense. Um, it's not like those would be convenient to reuse. How are you going to reuse code anyway? Uh, it's not like there's any convenient way of reusing the Rails code for different projects. Uh, and plugins or PR files. And uh, I don't know what you guys do, but I get paid by the line of code, right? <laughs> so, I'm going to write it once, and it'll probably be quicker to write it a second time because you've already been through it. Failed and succeeded and figured it out. By the fourth of the time, it's like a column, right? You get better, better writing this function. Especially if you're really going to have to ask for any of that. All right, so be bad at Groovy. Um, there isn't enough of the uh, philosophy in the Groovy community um, that the Perl community seems to have, which is to write um, code that no one else can read. Um, there's also the obfuscated C contest that they do. Same looking programs do crazy awesome things. There isn't, and there should be, an obfuscated degree. Um, so you definitely want to write, uh, you want to, we want to be those people. We want to be PHP slash Perl slash uh, obfuscated C programmers. Uh, so write Groovy that's as idiomatic as, as Groovy, Lorcas G, and Groovy, Lorcas G. So you don't have to um, declare your types. So why bother? D E F, right? It's right there on the keyboard. It's D E F. If you if you angle your fingers right, you can probably just go this, boop, <laughs> and just in one motion to get it to end. You can probably sign a key to that too, like. So, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know, you've seen the the, uh, the grids, right? So, the strongly typed, weakly typed, and everything typed, all that stuff. So, Groovy is optionally typed. Uh, under the hood, the array list will be an array list. The user will be the user. But you don't have to say that. You just say def u equals whatever. Um, closures. How oh, awesome are closures, right? So, we've got a few things that are really mysterious and cool and momentous. Less than five people in the room who can actually define Monet. I am not one of them. Um, but it sounds awesome, right? Monets. And uh, there's another one. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of really cool concepts for computer science. Closures is one of those awesome concepts. Um, so, um, people who don't know what you're going to do, if you tell them you're right, you work with closures, it's pretty sexy stuff. Um, so, Use closures instead of methods because Groovy is going to call the closure uh, as if it were a method. There's no runtime cost for that. Um, actually, and one quick thing, this is kind of another roadblock to the transaction comment. Um, it's 
probably less of, a, of an issue now with 2.0, but um, it's pretty easy before 2.0 to copy a controller closure, because we used to only support closures and controllers, over to a service. Because you, 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 you figure out that you know, you're doing a bunch of transactional work and you realize that um, you want to move your controller to a service, so you can copy the closure over to the service, take all the web related stuff or request and stuff, make it so much generic, and, and pass in uh, variables. Um, and then rewrite your, your controller uh, closure to call your, your uh, service. That's a really standard refactoring. But it was, it was really easy to forget to convert that closure to a, a function, to a new method. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that you can still call that closure in the service if you're zip over a method, right? Ruby doesn't care whether it's the syntax. I mean, you, you can, when you call a closure, it's actually under the hood. You are actually, you are actually calling the call method. But uh, Groovy syntax sugar allows you to call closures if it were a method. Um, the problem, though, with closures inside of services is that they are just a field, they're just an object. So Spring will never see that. The proxy, if you're using the old style, uh, is, uh, transaction support, um, that closure will not run transaction. I think that's far less of an issue now than it was uh, in the past, but I'm sure, like, the are using older versions of the <coughs> Um, closures are transfer dangerous. So, um, be groovy. Capital G and all the HG. Be as groovy as possible. Um, so, we're, we're tied on this. It's bringing about in our, in our shoes. Um, so, don't worry about um, rewriting code in, in Java or using uh, Samuel. Just write it groovy. Um, we'll, we'll be eventually more slow. And we'll have fast enough processors, big enough servers, horizontally scaled enough um, instances on EC2 that your slow code will be uh, fast enough. This is not an awesome link to click. There is not an insane amount of awesome information there at that link. Um, Guillaume LaForge wrote this. Um, I'm sure he read this, but I don't know why people would think he would know anything about Groovy or using Groovy as a Java developer, so um, lots and lots and lots of information there. Copy pasta. If it works once, it will work again. If we just copy and paste, we don't have to think about includes and tag libs. The more files we have in our project, the more complicated it is because we're going to think about where we're going to go to get that. And if I don't have to do that, if it's always just right there, because the copy and paste of it, that's awesome. Because I don't have to think about it. I don't have to have this map of my project. You know, where is this? Where is this? Is there a link for right there? <clears throat> so I think a corollary of this, of this slide um, is the on the internet and have to be true. So, um, so outside overflow must be correct. Especially if you have about books. If, however, you do end up copying and pasting uh, code to the environment, endeavor to find all those uh, instances of the code and fix it. You'll probably find those. Testing. I prefer to uh, let my users test my code in the um, Because who better than the users to know how the application should work, right? I mean, they're the customer. They're the users. If, if we didn't have users, well, so my life would be like too. Um, but I, I probably have less to do. Um, so they're the ones telling us what to do. You know, in, in general, you have a project idea. You have some awesome thing you're So you start working on it, you get some funding, you get a team going, and you start doing this thing. And then as people see it, they're, they're like, well, we've got to get this. So they're, they're the ones that are guiding you. So they should be able to check it for you. Now, I joking earlier about getting paid by line of code. So um, I don't want to have to write more code than I have to. And I'm 
sure, I'm sure you've all seen this, right? You decide endless garage, annoying people online saying, you gotta write your tests, and so we can use spot, and you can use gel, you can use all these cool things, and you like, I sort of write a test. And it passes. Like, Alright, that's cool. I wrote a test. I can check that checkbox. I've done a test in my life. I'm, I'm maybe I'm test driven. Then you get <laughs> a day or two later something changes and your tests fail. So, um, why did I even write this in the first place? This is crap. So, uh, so, your best bet is to either comment that out, uh, or just disable the tests in Jenkins, or, uh, because they're just going to spam you with emails about broken bills and jokes. It's so negative. I don't need more negative email. I would like to try to stay positive. Failing tests. So, you can, if you go home at 8 o'clock, something breaks, then you have a stock culture survivor, and you can just put down your big bowl of Cheetos, and walk on the VPN, and fix your test. And, uh, but if we didn't have tests, I'd still be chopping down on Cheetos as fast as I can in my system, and drinking my sugary Mountain Dew. Documentation and testing should be very important. Because so many things change, you're going to be having to rewrite your code. It's um, bad enough that I have to keep refactoring my real code. I have to keep refactoring my tests too, and it's just so much extra work. So, wait till the end. There will always be enough time to do the project to do documentation and testing, right? Because that's the work we will see. Don't just prefer your tests. Demand your tests. So, because um, they're fast, they run inside your IDE, and every level of testing gets bigger and slower and more annoying, right? So we've got unit tests, there's integration tests, there's functional tests, there's you know, QA and acceptance tests, and at every layer, there's more people involved, there's more structure involved, there's more machinery involved, there's more stuff, more time. Um, keep everything in the unit test level. Now, the fact that um, you're not really using a database. You're not actually communicating with a remote system. You're not actually testing the code the way it's supposed to be used. It's not, not, it's not a problem. Um, any project that has 100% test coverage of unit tests, where all the unit tests pass, is going to be a working project, right? Should it? We're uh, pretty sure later we've got 100% test coverage on unit tests. It has to work. But when we generate code in Grails, you say Grails, scratch main class, whatever person, or you write it by hand. Um, and then you say Grails generate all for this thing, right? So we're going to generate a controller, we're going to generate some DSPs, and we're going to generate a, a, a test class. It's pretty awesome. So that's this big, giant, throbbing light saying implement these tests. Um, and we create unit tests for your uh, domain classes. So you should not bother with testing domain classes against your database because you can use in memory form. You shouldn't have support for locking transactions or anything other than auto increment IDs. Um, but it's good enough. So don't, don't take those domain class tests and rewrite them as integration tests. Servers are uh, very annoying. Like I said, all you do is complain about the other ones. Negative, negative, negative. Security's hard. Um, but who's not up for a big challenge, right? You're smarter than the hackers. We are professional programmers. We're a unique of our society. Um, we take stuff on computers and so uh, every one of us is fully capable of creating a very robust, very um, unbreakable security scheme. So we should have think of that. 
Because as I was saying before, you know, uh, don't grieve this, just keep running it again. Uh, do not take advantage of years and years and years of bad hardened uh, security frameworks that have been uh, tested in banks and uh, military locations and have been hacked and have been fixed and patched and are ready to use just to do your show. We're all later on. I, for one, think that it's silly to uh, hack short or encrypt your passwords. Because um, if I forget my password, it would be great if you just email me. Because that's very, very secure. Um, I just finally figured out how to subtract from this annoying man list. But I took her recently, every month, she lost sending a freaking password and clear next to email. Who does that? Just insane. Um, if you, in all seriousness, if you're using a service and they send you a Clojure's password, stop using that service. Um, you shouldn't be able to get your password back. It's crazy. Um, the way that passwords should work is that you hash your password short of the database. You probably can't use solving all this stuff. And it isn't the case that you would unhash or decrypt your password and compare that to a Clojure's password. What you're supposed to do is rehash your Clojure's password to check the login form. Compare the hash values. You do not need to store your Clojure's password ever. It's just one of the stupidest thing you can do. All right, I'm back. Email is perfectly secure, right? You all use SSL email. Actually, if you ever look at Gmail, Um, and it's not your money. When the hackers get into your system, because you wrote your own security system and, and uh, left a little backdoor there that they could find, um, it's not your money. You have investors, it's their money. Again, go back to that, like this line, cover your tracks. Make sure when you get hacked that A, it's not your money, and B, it's not obvious that it's your money. Store passwords and source controls. Um, Security. No one's going to figure it out. I think this is less true now. I think people have finally done this because Amazon actually uh, contacted uh, uh, repo owners. But for a while now, actually, uh, I should check this again. I'll bet there's still several thousand things for this. But this is a real link. And uh, people were storing their S3 credentials in uh, source control and in, in, in a bulk repos. That's not crazy at all. Um, what I was thinking about doing, and it's probably still doable, is uh, creating a distributed um, data store using S3 stolen S3 cryptos. <laughs> so what you could do is you could borrow just a little bit of a rose account. If you just take over their account and you, and you use all the storage there to figure it out, but if you just take a little bit, if you're a new bucket, if they got a whole bunch of buckets and you just add a new one that has a similar naming convention, it'll be a lot before they notice it. Uh, or we're going to just kind of create a really deeply uh, folder structure um, and store stuff in their S3. Now, you, you wouldn't want to just store one copy because that would be crazy. As soon as they find it, they're going to delete it. And, uh, so you want to store redundant copies. But you want it to be highly available. And then make sure that you monitor as they find it and delete it. You want to make sure that you then take that, that copy and replicate that somewhere else. But keep at least three or four or five copies of all your data. Use 5% of 10,000 accounts. That's all you have. Series uh, amongst the stores that are available to them. And it's just, it's like free money. Because that money that you would spend on storage, they can just give it to you. It's like pretty money. Um, sadly, Amazon had to go get a whole weird about it and contact all the owners and tell them we're stupid and you should stop doing this. Really so, seriously, um, all it's like, it's you know, you can still get out, but it's Okay, so fail and error true. So way back when, we had a uh, request from some Rails users, and they were saying that um, in Rails, when you validate a, their, they call domains, yes. So they have the same, they steal a lot of ideas from, from Rails. 
So a lot of the things that we can do, they also do in the real So they have a concept of, of uh, controllers and things that make us just like everybody do. So, so um, they have validation. So we have validation errors. And um, they use a slightly different language than, than we do. Uh, they use Ruby. And uh, so they have the same function to make message name safe. Right? So if they make an instance, you populate it with data, you call save. If it doesn't validate, just like in Grails, it doesn't actually save it to the database, and there are associated errors that you can look at to see what went wrong. That, you know, if there's something that was required that you didn't have, or you know, it needed to be an email and it wasn't valid, whatever. So um, if you wanted to throw an exception instead, you can say save back, right? Save exclamation point, you have to use your relative from other things. Um, so we had a request on the mailing list for uh, this, the equivalent feature in Grants. When you can execute it very conveniently, somehow get saved to throw an exception. Um, so unfortunately, the grammar for Ruby doesn't support this right now. It could. I actually uh, talked to Gail about this a little while ago. Um, and we, we could change Ruby to support save exclamation point. Right now, it would actually won't take a while. So what we did say was we already have support for a map in save. Um, you can say plus true. And you can say uh, validate false, deep validate false. There's a few options you can pass in to save the uh, so we added in an extra one, fail and error. So um, this is awesome, because it really aggressively fails. It just explodes. <laughs> Fireworks. Um, so you should use exceptions for flow control in general, because I wouldn't you know, go to this are great. And uh, don't bother with checking the errors, because that will just be boring. Um, Is a uh, this link here is uh, not at all anything has nothing to do with Ruby, um, but it's a discussion, a very um, lengthy discuss discussion of the costs of acceptance in Java, um, and so all that uh, all the numbers there are valid in, in a Grails slash Ruby based application, except for even worse. Um, again, this is big um, You guys have seen Ruby stackers, right? They're massive. They just go on and on and on forever. Because uh, there's all those extra stack ranks, right? It's all that dynamic. It's every, every call is a user question. There's the call side caching checks. There's tons and tons of extra frames for every single pop, every single thing, every single pop in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the stack. So uh, we hide that now. We're really good at condensing that so that uh, it's way less noise and way more signal. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that under the hood, there is a gigantic amount of information that's gathered there. So when you throw an exception in, in, in the JVM, um, the JVM has to stop, it has to look at all this, has to inspect the entire stack, it has to fill in that stack trace to then end that exception. And if you don't use that information, then if there's a huge waste there. And if you're in query, you're creating an even larger uh, waste of time. There. So exceptions are really expensive in Ruby, even more so than in Java. The cost of a single exception is not a big deal, but it's when, it, when you do this in loops, you have a very uh, heavily trafficked applications to that up. So it's definitely going to be before it's impact. Back to the talk. Um, we look at these two code examples. The one on the left is clearly better. You populate a domain class instance with data from a map. Is a very convenient way of doing that. You can uh, populate the fields of the object however you like uh, with your own map. You know, setting field by field however you do that. So you set all the data and then you go to save it and then validation fires. And um, if there are validation errors, then you throw an exception and you catch that exception and then you deal with the fact that something happened. The code on the right isn't nearly identical. It isn't way less expensive. It isn't way probably the same. Great. Can anyone get serious with it? Do you guys like fail and error? Do you like the exceptions? I'm very sure you're not going to be the one person who's going to be like, yeah, I like this one. Rolling back to the back of the test. Yeah, they're good for tests. Sure. 
We have a setting though where you can turn it on and cool it automatically so that it always happens. Don't ever do that. <laughs> um, there are definitely cases when, when you know that the data has to be correct, when you're forcing data in tests, when you're doing stuff in Bootstrap, for example, so you're adding the values, right? So you know that these should work. In the future, something could, where it could change. So um, that is a, a case where you would want it to be loud and, and Sometimes you want to roll back transactions. Never use transactions. Never use to roll back transactions. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> ever. Um, 10 minutes, I can show you how transaction count in 10 minutes. Um, it's a really expensive way to roll back a transaction. Um, I, I did a talk in Grand Hair Comp, I think, two years ago on transactions, so I think you should watch that. Um, it's a side effect. The, in the spring support for, for transaction exceptions, mirrors very closely the J2WE support. So in Java, uh, we have checked exceptions. We don't have to worry about this so much in Ruby. Um, if you have a <coughs> checked exception that is thrown from a transactional method, the assumption in J2WE and in spring exception handling is that you didn't know that that happened have to do a try catch. So since the system is potentially out of sync, it's going to automatically let fault for what that transaction for you. Um, if it's a check exception, you either have to put it in the first clause and handle it that way, or do a try catch. So you, you have to have been given a chance to work with this exception. So a check exception, by default, does not automatically go back to transaction. Because you have been given a chance to, to handle that case. In Groovy, however, we blur those distinctions. So everything is essentially a, a, a unchecked exception. So in Groovy, you can throw a check or an unchecked exception. Um, and I have to think about it. Um, what we should do instead, and there's a little bit of work you need to do to get to this, but you can get to the, uh, there's a transaction status object. Um, and what you want to do instead is call set rollback only on that transaction status object. Because using an exception to roll back a transaction does that, but at the cost of creating an unnecessary exception. And all you're doing is creating this explosion so that something notifies, notices the explosion and does something based on that. It's a side effect. It's, 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 it, it is an expensive side effect. So uh, don't do that. All right, so I'll go back. Um, I think that these look very different. I'm really excited about using them on the left. So these exceptions, exceptions are awesome.
printed a, they were using security and they printed a new feature and they sent out this email to everyone, all these companies that collect this link. This is a new cool thing that we have to use. What it did was it would auto register them as a user, auto grant them a default role, basically, on this user, and then give them access to this thing. And then for later on, they could get more or less uh, access to more, more control based on their roles. And they were getting weird exceptions where they were getting current modification code from the role class. The short version of the what, what this article talks about is that um, if take users for example, right? so hiring is very um, customized. So if you cache something that has a user in the results in it, and you edit a user, delete a user, create a user, that user could have participated in the, that results in. Hiring can't know that, so it's going to flush anything that's cached that has any. So any class that changes a lot, is going to be a good caching in for for results. Um, so what can happen is you can actually by caching and trying to save yourself, uh, trying to <coughs> offload some of the processing processing data, and stuff, you can actually be more it can be more expensive because you do the query, store the cache, something then immediately validates the cache, and then the next thing comes in. Has to go to the database anyway. Then has to spend the time to cache the stuff. If you're using a distributed cache, it's going to have to send it around to the cluster. And every query is still going to the database because you've got these changes that are causing a hard to auto flush your, your cache stuff. So it can actually be more expensive to cache than to. 
to not cash, depending on the cashability of your main class. So you want to think about roles, for example. You know, the new menus are very cashable because they're already ever edited a row. Uh, you're probably not going to be creating them or deleting the runtime, so those are very cashable. You just, on the other hand, are not very cashable. So you want to think about like, how cashable is this query, how cashable is this main class. Thank you. 